So guys, of course, a lot on my show, I talk about launching podcasts, producing and hosting. But of course, you got to think about the other side of the mic. There is so much to be gained from guesting on podcasts. And the biggest question I get is, how do I get on shows? And when I saw Pitch DB and Ron Story, I just had to have him on the show because it was so unique. So I'm so glad to have you on the show, Ron. Oh, thanks for having me. I, I appreciate you taking the time to introduce me to your audience and trusting that I can help. I know you will. Um, so before we start, just I just want to kind of frame it of like, what is Pitch DB and why did you start it? And then we'll kind of get into the nitty gritty of the whys and the tips and all that good nuggets for the for the audience. Yeah, so I'm a sales guy by by nature. If you go to St. Louis and you go in the startup place called T-Rex, they'll say, who's the sales guy here? They'll all say, Ron, call Ron. Even <laughs> though I'm, I don't even live in St. Louis anymore, I live in Medellin, Colombia, they will still say, call Ron, right? So I've been known as the sales guy. Nice. And I was known for setting up sales systems in startups. So I've been talking to strangers my whole life, reaching out via email. And a friend of mine came to me and said, hey, I know you set up all these sales appointments. Can you get me speaking gigs? And I was like, I probably can't get you the gig, but I can get you the meeting. Yeah. So I'll email some event planners to see if we can get you meetings to talk about potentially speaking at their conferences. And we did that. And it was like, oh, yeah, this is easy. This is it works. And they were like, no, you got to keep doing it. I don't think you realize how hard this is. And I'm is. like, you just email people, right? So we eventually built PitchDB to help people to get booked for speaking gigs. Well, then we know what happened in the world in, nine, in yep. what was it, 2020. We yep. launched November of 2019 and March of 2020, the world shut down. So there were no more speaking gigs, but everybody was at home. So we added podcasting to it, to our software. So people could reach out to get booked on podcasts because they became the, the new speaking gig. So that's the origin story of, of, of PitchDB. It's built from a sales perspective, right. not from a speaker's perspective. It's built right. from a sales perspective, meaning that volume is what matters. Tracking your data is what matters. Follow-up is what matters. Yeah. Because if you're a business owner, you know that reaching out is part of sales, but following up is a more important part of sales. So regardless of what your business is, if you're trying to get on a platform, whether that's in media and speaking and podcasting, any type of platform that's going to allow you to share your perspective, the key thing that you can do is follow up. So PitchDB is, is built around allowing you to efficiently reach out and efficiently follow up. So it shouldn't take you longer than maybe 45 seconds to actually pitch a podcast. Yeah, I love that. And I, I, looked at the demo and was checking it out. And I love how the dashboard instantly tells you like how many pitches you've sent, how many, you know, were yeses, how many shows, but also like tracking the results. Um, and you don't see that a lot where it comes to pitching in the sales arena. So it's great that you're pulling that in. Why is it important to track and what is it that we're tracking or need to track? Yeah. So uh, imagine this. If, if you're, let's take it away from pitching to be on podcast. Yeah. Let's just talk okay. about selling. If I, if a potential customer, I reach out to a potential customer and they say, um, yeah, I would love to talk to you about your product, but I don't follow up with them for three weeks. They probably have bought it from someone else. Yeah. Right. So if I reach out to a podcaster and they say, yeah, what's your idea? Who did you have as a potential guest? And if it's me, I need to follow with them the same day. I, hey, yo, it's me. Here's my bio. And here's why I think I would be a good guest. Now I can make my pitch. So the follow-up part is the most important part, right? So you may reach out to someone. They may not get back to you the first time. Right. So you follow with them a second time. You say, hey, I just want to push this back up to the top mm -hmm. of your parties. Why? Because we're all busy. Yeah. Right? As entrepreneurs, we're all busy. And podcasters are busy too. So a lot of times they forget. We get caught up doing oh, something totally. else that's more important. But who benefits the most from you being on the show? The guest. I benefit more. In my mind, I think I have a better benefit of being on your podcast right now 
than the service that I'm providing to you by being a guest. Because you're introducing me to your audience. I'm just introducing them to information that I have. Now, the hope is that it ends up being an equal exchange at worst, right? But I have to think of it from a selfish standpoint, like, yo, I need to do everything I can to make it as easy as possible for this podcast host to choose me. Yes. Right? Because if I'm not, if if the one person is consistent and they're persistent with following up, they've sent me all their information, it's going to be easy for me to choose this person. They just saved me three hours of guest research. Seriously, right? So that's how I think about it. I know that was a long answer, but I no, think the good. context um, will help people to understand the importance of following up. Yeah. Just like you would if you were trying to make a sale, because that's what it is, right? You're selling them on bringing you on and trusting you. And you want to come across as professional. You're, you're, you're kind of demonstrating all of that before you show up. True. And I, I feel like, like when I get emails, like, Hey, just following up on when I sent you last week. And again, it's probably buried and I just got lost and whatever, um, or got deleted accidentally when people follow up, I'm like, Oh, thank goodness. <laughs> I'm like, thank you. Cause yes, I was totally busy and didn't get around to you know, responding it. And it shows that you're diligent and, you know, I would rather work with someone meets with someone that has those personality traits um, you brought something up that I wanted to kind of ping on. And that was like the tracking part. And does, do you find it helps figure out what's working and not working kind of like on the, you know, the marketing tracking side of things? Yeah. So in pitch to we've set this up to do it automatically, right? Mm -hmm. So you have different categories of pitches that you can do. You can reach out to media. You can reach out to podcasts. You can reach out to local associations, such as the, the associations that have conferences. If you want to be a speaker or you want to be an exhibitor, you can, or a sponsor, you can reach out to them. You can reach out to international conferences, right? Um, so we have a lot of different opportunities for you to share your perspective. That's what we're about. How do you share your perspective with the world, right? So when you send a pitch to um, a podcaster, you can sort to show what your booking ratio was just for oh. podcast, right? We can see what your booking ratio is just for conferences or press right. or local associations so that you'll know where you're being the most effective, right? right? So after you've received a booking, we just ask that you do a small thing. Ask the person, What's the audience size? How many downloads should I expect, right? So then now, once you've been booked, you can put into PitchDB how many people you've actually impacted with your message. Oh, so cool. if I'm on this podcast and it has 5,000 downloads or 10,000 downloads, I can put that in, in my thing. And over the year, if I've been on 50 podcasts and I've done 20 speaking gigs, I can see that I've impacted 150,000 people with my message this year, yeah. which then I can juxtapose that against my revenue to mm. say for every one person that I reached on a podcast, I made $3. Okay. I need to go on more podcasts to keep getting these right. $3. Covered in, right? So again, it's from a sales perspective because yeah. podcasting is a marketing channel. Yep. No different than how you would track your um, key performance indicators for Facebook ads or Google ads or direct mail or email marketing. Podcasting needs to have that same type of tracking. Yeah. So that's what PitchDB tries to solve, you know, as much as we can without, um, you know, like making up stuff. So we just asked that you ask the host to tell you the number mm. of, of um, downloads because yeah. that's not really publicly available. No. Right. Or if you were on a, say you went and spoke at a conference and the conference had 750 attendees, well, you right. want to be able to put that in there, right? That so that's what we, we want to treat it like a sales channel. It shouldn't just be, oh, that was cute. I went on there and, <laughs> you know, some people know about me. Nah, no. bro, we want you to make some money. This is all about cash. Yeah. Like it should drive revenue for your business or at least drive some type of awareness. Agreed. 100%. So smart. Now let's get into the nitty gritty of like 
how like you can pitch all you want, but it doesn't mean you're going to get picked. You know what I mean? So how do you make a really good profile? Okay. So I think that the, the key to getting booked, whether it's for a, a speaking gig or any type of opportunity, whether it's press is knowing exactly who has your audience, yeah. right? And then thinking from the perspective, what is the benefit of this person choosing me? Right. Right. So if I talked about basket weaving, I don't make sense to be on your podcast. Correct. It doesn't fit your audience for what your for what your audience wants to learn about by listening to you. So I think people should be as specific as possible first before they create their own profiles and all of that. And they need to find out who has my people. Okay. Right. And then you you will make your pitch specifically for that particular podcast. So I believe in a two-step pitching approach hmm. and I'll, I'll, I'll share it with you if you, yeah, if you would like. Absolutely. Right? So pitching is like dating, <laughs> right? And this is an analogy everybody will get. Imagine you're at a bar or you're out someplace at a networking event, if you don't go to bars and you see an attractive person that you wanted to introduce yourself to. Would you go over to them and say, hey, my name is Ron, and then go into a five paragraph speech about all the people you've dated in the past, about how you think that if they work with you, you're gonna be the greatest family man, and you're gonna raise kids, you're gonna have a house and travel the world. Is that the first thing that would come out of your mouth when you met someone out in a public place? Heck to the no. <laughs> yeah, exactly. You would be weird. It would be a weird move, right? So as guys, we've learned this over <laughs> millions of years of evolution. We've learned, don't do that, right? Yeah. So what do we learn to do? Pitch for engagement, right? And what does that mean? Let me show you the typical male pitch for engagement. Hey, how are you doing? And if there's no engagement, we don't even talk to her anymore. <laughs> right True that. she says i'm married <laughs> Ooh, move on right but if she says i'm doing okay how are you i'm doing well my name is ron and then now i can go into my whole thing right right so let me translate that over to pitching for speaking gigs because i've booked people on forbes inc um marketing profs Moz, the largest conferences ever with this one simple approach and not to mention 2,000 podcasts last year, right? So the approach is, are you looking for interesting guests for your podcast? If so, can you tell me the next steps? That's all you say. Don't send your bio with all this extra one pager and all of that stuff. Yeah. Because if they're not looking for interesting guests, then- It's a moot point. Why, did, why even matter? She's married. Move on, right? She's here <laughs> with her boyfriend. Move on, you know? So what the response that we get back is, yeah, we're looking for guests for August. Or we're looking for guests for January or whenever. Right. Who did you have in mind? Now I send my one pager. Now I send more about my bio and all of those things to show that, number one, I was respectful of their time because 99% of emails are read where? on the cell phone. So does someone really want to be scrolling and trying and clicking to read links and yeah, from a stranger? They don't even know you yet. Do I really want to listen to your five right. minute, five paragraph pitch? And we don't even know each other. Right. But once the person says, yeah, who did you have in mind? Well, they ask for you to give them that information. No different than the person at the bar when you say, hey, how's it going? And they say, I'm doing well. How are you? They've asked for you to introduce yourself at that right. point. Right. So it's just taking the normal human interactions. Yeah. And the respect true. That give each other in person and just translating it over to email. Email is just printed voice. Right. So if I wouldn't say it to you out of my mouth, I'm probably not going to write it in an email. <laughs> Does that make sense? It makes total sense. I love that. And I find too, like just in this online world, we are moving more to like, hey, man, I just want to have a regular conversation with a normal person. 
it's that those stiff kind of templated, you know, back and forths. And it's just people just, I don't know, their shoulders go up, right? You're just, like, Ugh. Um, well, yeah, I, you- yeah. What, I love that approach. It It's so smart. Now, here's a question for you. How much of the process can you, should you be doing yourself or how much can you actually outsource to someone? Well, I think at the beginning, you should be doing it yourself, right? Because how do you know what to teach someone to do if you've yeah. never done it? How do you respect the process that someone else is doing if you've never done it, right? right. So I used to, my background before this was as a financial advisor. And financial advisory is one of the only industries where the boss was probably in your position at one point, right? Because most financial advisors who run a big office, they started at the bottom working for someone else. And then they worked their way up. They didn't just get put as the manager at this office, right? So he empathizes with your progress as you get better, right? So I learned that. And I'm like, well, anything I ever give my employees to do, we have nine employees, anything that I've ever given my employees to do that I was qualified to do, like I can't code, so I couldn't do that for them, right? But anything else, I've done it first in order to write out the standard operating procedure. Mm -hmm. And then I give it to them with the estimated time it takes to complete it, what their expectations should be. Here's what you may expect on the negative side. Here's what you may expect on the positive side. And then now they know that I trust what he's saying because I've seen him do it. Right. Right. That's a good so point. I think you build great respect from your employees by doing it first yourself. Yeah. Getting the process down and then giving it over to an employee. But if they're using pitch DB, you know, we will give you the instructions on how to do it so that either you or your employee can follow through, but it just makes it a lot easier if they get caught up on something versus having to wait on support to respond. They can just say, hey, you know, or here's another thing. I have people that say, oh yeah, my my staff is pitching for me. And I'm like, okay, how long have they been working on this? And they'll say, oh, she's been working on it for two weeks. And I'm like, she's only sent out two pitches. It takes literally a minute to send a pitch <laughs> why is she only sent out two yeah and they're like it, it doesn't she said she was getting caught up on this or that but i'm like but she hasn't even made a list she hasn't even connected her email account she hasn't done any of the basics right so that's why it's good for you to do it first so you can call bs with your employees <laughs> just giving your money your virtual assistant over in the philippines yeah, yeah right is just running up the clock on you and Mm -hmm. giving you an excuse because they didn't want to do the work. So that's, that's what we figured out. Yeah. And it helps you support them better because you understand you can answer their questions quicker. You can troubleshoot. Um, I'm totally the same way. I can't just go figure this out and do it. Like I have to understand it. And so that, yeah, I'm, I'm too type A anyways. I couldn't, I couldn't not do it first. What happens if they quit? Part of me. What happens when they quit? If you oh, just exactly, if you just told the person go figure it out, and they they figure it out on your dime, and then they decide to leave, they left with all the intellectual property. Yeah, yeah. Like your they group. took all the systems. Now you got to go figure it out again. And, yeah. No, just do oh, it thanks. once yourself. It don't cost that much of time. I know. Do it once yourself to figure it out. Document it on Loom. So I'll give them the. I'll give you the template for if you're going to have an assistant do it. Here's what I do. I always do it and record myself doing it on Loom after I figured it out. That way we know how much time it takes. Mm -hmm. So then I send the Loom video to my employee and I say, hey, make a Loom video with you doing it and send it back to me. What does that do? Now they can't say it took 35 minutes because in the Loom video, they did it in three minutes. <laughs> so they just That's made brilliant. themselves accountable. Yeah. So now you can't tell me it took 35 minutes to figure it out because you just did it in 45 seconds on Loom. Yeah, yeah. So do 50 of these every day and then do the other stuff with the other three hours of work. <laughs> Seriously, that is so smart. I do Looms, but I never think to like, and I give time estimates, but but yeah, that's a great tip. 
All right. So let's get into the pitching part of it. So obviously, you know, you've got engagement, you've got some back and forth. They're interested. I've seen so many types of emails come my way of like no information that they've given me, no links and too much and just information that I don't care about. (laughs) What is the right thing to send? Okay. So after you've sent your pitch for engagement and they said, yeah, tell me who would you like or who do you suggest? If it's yourself, this is what you would say, right? So the first thing you should do is just send a quick bio with the value of what you'll provide to the show, not your where you went to college and all this stuff, but what's the value you're going to bring to the audience, right? And what I would provide after that is a couple of links to podcasts that you've already been on, right? or YouTube videos of you that may be other interviews of showing that you can provide this value, right? And then let them decide, right? Because what they're looking for is to make sure that they're not going to bring someone on, waste an hour of time recording, or risk having this person come on and embarrassing them if it's a live show. Yeah, yeah. Right? So you just, all you're doing is providing them with the the um, proof that you are who you said you were. Mm, true. That's what's worked for me, okay. right? So, and then all I would ask for is a, hey, is it possible to have a 10 minute intro call, right? So then now I'm not even asking to be on the show anymore. I'm oh, betting that right. if I get on a 10 minute call with you, I can convince you that I'm worthy of being on the show. Yeah. And they can ask questions about, you know, what your topics are and how, they can envision more what you're going to talk about together and how it's going to pan out in the end. Yeah, because you've given them that in that first part of the paragraph right? Hey, I would love to come on your show. I run a company called PitchDB. I help people to get booked on podcasts. You know, I can, I think your audience would benefit from learning about what I've done over the last year. I've booked over 6,000 people on this, this, and that. Yeah, come on. I don't know anybody else who's booked 6,000 people. Yeah. Yeah. I think you probably could add something to this conversation, right? (laughs) Yeah. And you pulled in your, your level of credibility as well, which I like. Yeah. So that's the, so I'm a big fan of not telling people what to do, but tell people what I do. Mm. Right. So I'm going to, you should do this. No, here's what I do. Right. And it's worked for me. If it's worked for me to get me booked and Uh, it's worked for me and what I do for my clients, then I have proof that it works versus just saying, do this, do that, do this, do that. I'm not going to boss you around. (laughs) Give me the blueprint. I know you keep it real. I love it. Now on the part about like, who do you go to, to pitch? Cause I know your software helps kind of like bring that research time down, create lists, which is so good. Cause sometimes you do all the research and then you pitch and do that part later. Like you only have so much time in the world, but how do you choose which is the right show to pitch on to pitch? Right. So before you do anything inside of any software, whether it's us or one of our competitors, here's what you should do. I'm going to give you the biggest hack. Like if you just do this, you don't, you'll never worry about podcast research ever again. Here's what you do. Make a list of the people who you aspire to be. Yeah. First, and then make a list of people who you are equal to or one step behind. Everybody knows their peers in their business yes. and somebody that may be two steps ahead of them. Man, they're yeah. on podcast. Why ain't I on podcast, right? So they, they have these little secret admirers, yeah. right? Make a list of those folks and then hop into whatever software you want to use. You can do this with iTunes. You don't have to use PitchDB. You can hop in and just search for those people. Now, why would you do that? Well, if you're if they're your competitors, they already found the audiences for you. Yeah, yeah, I ain't that the truth. You know that that podcast wants to talk about that topic because they right. had them on it. You know that they have the right audience that you fit because they had your competitor on there. So now, just reach out to them. You know that they are interview based podcasts. They're not just monologue podcasts, right? right? So just 
you can find a hundred great podcasts to be on just by searching for the podcast that your competitors have already been on. And here's the thing. Even if they haven't been on in the last week to talk about that topic, you probably got a good chance of coming back on. Yeah. Right. Because guess what? Your competitors usually have a different perspective than you. Agreed. So I can reach out and say, Hey, I saw you had Lindsay Phillips on your podcast and she talked about, um, getting how to get booked on podcast. I thought it was a great episode. I think I could add to that conversation because mm. I can show them, I can also help your audience get booked for speaking gigs and show them how to get more press. You notice I didn't poop on what Lindsay was yeah, doing. Yeah, yeah, totally. All I did was did a, and yeah, but like I can do an and. I can take what she's doing and say, yeah, and you can do this, right? So now it shows, yeah. oh yeah, I didn't even think about speaking gigs or press it. or local conferences or things of that sort. So now I come on with a different perspective. Now, will some of our podcast stuff bleed over into each other? Sure, that's just natural in, in the conversation because yeah, we're in the same industry. But our perspectives are different. Lindsay may believe in the one one pitch approach, but mine is a two-step. So when I talk about yeah. that, it's going to be different. She may not use a dating example. She may have a way better example than that, but this is one that's authentic to me. Yeah. So I'll use mine, right? So the easiest hack, if you want to just kind of find the right people right away without having to learn how to do a bunch of keyword research, find the, make a list of all of your competitors and your dream people. Grant Cardone, if that's if you're in sales, or <laughs> Vargas, or any of these guys that are kind of like the sales gurus, if that's your thing, find the podcast that they've been on because they they they're just not going on the big ones. Yeah, they're going agreed. on some crappy ones too. So yep. reach out to them. <laughs> like, I love it. That's so smart. I love all your hacks. Um, now. Obviously your software, again, I love that it also has opportunities above and beyond podcasting. Is the approach any different where it comes to the media or conferences or? So when it comes to conferences, it's exactly the same. Okay. You know, we just add a different sentence and we, we teach you this inside, right? Oh, perfect. So we just add a, a really simple sentence. So with a guest, you would ask, are you looking for interesting guests for your podcast? Right. But for a conference, you would say, hey, I found the Inc. 5000 Women's Conference. Are you looking for interesting speakers or replacement speakers for this event? Right. Or a future event. Oh, right. Right. Now, the key is that replacement speaker thing. Right. So the first time I reach out, I don't even want to be the main speaker. I don't even want to be one of the. My intent is at worst, become a backup. Because if they can approve me to say, yo, if somebody backs out, we'll give you a call. That means you would have picked me at the beginning anyway. <laughs> Do you see what I mean? Yeah, so yeah. If I you to say, yeah, well, when somebody drops out, we'll, we'll definitely we'll keep you there because they have these breakout rooms and all yeah. these other things and people get sick. Things happen. Totally. I want to be on that list. And I know everybody else is not asking to be on that list. No. So smart. But by asking to be on that list, that means I'm willing to drop everything. If you need me mm -hmm. 24 hours, before, and I will show up and be ready. Right. Where everyone That's else an is asset like, to them oh, for sure. Oh, it's huge because nobody else has thought about it. No. So now I'm, I'm the only person that wants to be the backup. <laughs> right? So I booked a TED Talk this way. Right? Ooh. That's all I did. I just reached out to the lady. It was after the, the submission thing. And I said, hey, I know the submission has passed. Mm. And I know people drop out. Stuff happens. Is it possible that I could be on your backup speaker list just in case if one of them bails? And she was like, cool. They did the event, nobody bailed. I got a call three days after the event saying, hey, our next event is in four months. We want, we want to make you one of the main speakers. Sweet. So, because I had already solved 
one of their speaker slots by qualifying to be a backup anyway. Yeah, yeah. And it's a no brainer so, for them because they don't have to do any searching. They're like, oh, this person already reached out. You've done half the work for them. Dollars. Yeah, she's already looked at my videos. She's already heard me talk. I've already sent her references. All of that was already done. So I'm yeah. just staying in line, right? So that's that's one of the um, differences in the approach. The email will have this backup thing. You're right. not trying to be a backup guest on a podcast. It doesn't make no, sense, no. right? But for a speaking gig, that backup is a huge untapped yeah. sales hack. Right? That's gold. And yeah, we've we've used that. But it's still the pitch for engagement. Mm -hmm. And here's the thing. The larger the conference, they don't want to receive your pitch anyway. And I'll tell you why. The first pitch they want. But what they're going to send back to you, when you pitch Inc. and Fortune and these guys, they have a secret application page Agreed, yeah. that you can't Google or anything. So when you ask, are you looking for speakers? They're going to say, sure, here's our speaker application. Exactly. So sending that five page paragraph telling them your bio, they just going to ignore that because they don't want to read it. No, they think it's a sales pitch trying to sell products and services first off. Right. Mm -hmm. So if you can get to the point, they'll send you the application and then you apply through that application. Yeah. And that's that's how the larger ones, the higher up you go, they're going to have a standardized thing for so that they can track the thousands of applicants. That they yeah, do. that makes sense. And you said you have media in there as well, right? Like publications. Yep. So th there's media, there's uh, radio, okay. there's television, there's magazines, and we give you the editor-in-chief, general writers, uh, local reporter, uh, show producers for um, for television, you know, um, newspapers. They're all in there. So yeah. you can reach out to um, a magazine. Like, for instance, I my background was in financial services. So I would reach out to financial services magazines and ask, are you looking for... Um, uh, contributing writers, right? And then I would just send them links to some of my blog articles that I've already written, right? Because I would rather be a contributing writer than feature. And that's just my own belief, Oh, right? Yeah, in industry-specific magazines, I think it's better to be the contributing writer because now the whole article, when I buy the leaflets from them, it's going to have their logo at the top. But this article was written by me. I wasn't just featured. So all of the words are mine. They just oh, didn't I see take what you mean. Them. Yeah, yeah. Right. But in a big entrepreneur magazine, Inc. magazine, Fortune, you're probably just going to be featured because they they may not let you be a writer. But Fair if enough. you get industry specific, they're like, dude, you want to write an article about yeah, yeah. <laughs> pod, podcast guesting? We don't know anything about that. We could interview, but if you could just give us the 10 steps on how a financial advisor can appear on podcast and you're not pitching in the inside of it and it's not just a sales letter, we'll let you write that every day, right? Solves so, the problem for them. Yeah, exactly. So bylined articles work for very specific, industry-specific publications good to know they're 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 willing to do it if you don't believe me you ever heard of op-eds that's all that an op-ed is like um what is it called an opinion editor in newspapers oh they let they just let people write like yo you want to write this yeah he's our he's our op-ed guy and he just writes articles his opinion they say hey look the opinions of ron's story are not the opinions of the wall street <laughs> Journal, yeah but it's here right Whatever you're published, yeah. but that's how that works with, with, yeah. um, that's how I would approach it. I love it. Your tips are gold. You have gotten me excited about going into pitch DB and seeing what opportunities are on my horizon for 2023. I am yeah, yeah, so that's... glad you came on here on the show. Um, now how can people get a free trial and try it out? Dive in. Yeah. So there are two ways to, to try out PitchDB without paying anything, right? One is that you can just go to PitchDB and sign up for a passive account, but it won't let you pitch, right? right? It'll let you create a profile and then people can find you, 
Right. Right. So that's our standard free trial, right? Sense. Just, hey, hop in. You can see what the software does. But I'm sure your audience wants something better than that. You want to take so, action, man. <laughs> yeah, right? So if you go to pitchdb.com slash S-M-O-O-T-H, smooth, like the name of the podcast, right? I'll You will go and you'll fill out a form and sign up. We'll give you a free account and we'll give you $50 worth of credits, Sweet. right? And what those free $50 worth of credits will allow you to do is to reach out to 25 podcasts, 25 speaking gigs, 25 whatever you want to pitch. Yeah. If you're reaching out to podcast, our universal average inside of users using pitch to be from the best ones to the worst mm -hmm. is if you reach out to five people, you will get booked on one. That's pretty amazing. Right now we've had people that have done better than that, but this is yeah. just the average. Totally. I'm not saying that your audience is average. I'm just saying if they are, with those 25 pitches, they'll at least be on four to five podcasts. If they're really good and they've listened to all your episodes, and they follow your tips and they take yeah. the hack that I did with finding their um, their competitors and reaching out to those podcasts, mm -hmm. out of those 25 pitches, they'll probably be on seven to eight podcasts if they follow up and just stick with it. That's killer. That's a huge ROI for your time and um, and getting more visibility and authority over the next year. That's awesome. Yeah, no, it's incredible. And it, let's say, for instance, you reach out to 25 and you only get booked on three. Oh, well, you only got booked on three. It's three more than what you have. Totally. Before, Still a game. <laughs> I love it. I'm so excited. Yeah, this is going to be good. I'm so glad I had you on the show. You gave such good tips and hacks. Love it. I so appreciate your time. Yeah, no, th thanks for having me. Um, again, I, I try to tell people what I've done Yeah. versus what to do. So there's no theory, right? Everything that I've suggested today, I've lived. Yeah. Right. And, you know, we, we have no problem with showing the results. If you go to on the PitchDB page, you'll see people will say, hey, I sent 25 pitches in 15 minutes and got a result back. Yeah. Someone booked me that day or this podcast appearance turned into a speaking gig. Sweet. Right. Yeah. And so all of these things there, people are on there talking about it and they didn't post it on Pitch TV. They actually put this on their social media pages. So mm, they nice. were posting this on Facebook without, without me begging them to do it. Right? <laughs> the proof is in the pudding, as they say. Yeah. I love it. So, well, thank you so yeah, much. Yeah. And uh, I can't wait to share this episode with the world. Yeah. Hey, I'm glad I could help. If you have any other questions, just, Give me a buzz. I'll be around. Perfect. All right. All right. See Thanks. you folks.